My husband has been dead for six months now. He was driving home late from work the night that I received the call, and my world got turned upside down. We live in the small town of Puxico, Missouri. Charlie worked in Poplar Bluff, which is about a 30-minute drive over winding, hilly roads. The police officer that had responded to the accident said that Charlie must have fallen asleep at the wheel and ran his truck off the road, driving right through the barbed wire fence and then colliding head-on with the tree. He was pronounced dead on the scene, and my world began to fall apart. I was a stay-at-home mom. I looked after our house and took care of our then five-year-old daughter, Taylor. Taylor and Charlie were a match made in heaven. From the day she was born, Taylor was stuck to her father like glue. They were inseparable. As she got older, the bond grew stronger. She never really wanted much to do with me. Charlie was her everything, and she was his. I had a very hard time trying to figure out how to explain this new change to Taylor. She kept asking the same questions. When is Daddy coming home? Do you think he's close? I miss him. And every time she'd ask, I would break down crying. Finally, I broke the news to her. Sweetie, I said, eyes starting to fill with tears again. Daddy's in heaven with the angels, but he will always be watching over you. Taylor just stared at me, no signs of emotion, no signs of comprehension on her face. Finally, unable to contain myself any more, I broke down. In between sobs, I said, Baby, I love you very much. It's okay to cry. But still, Taylor didn't say a word. She showed no emotion at all. I tried my best to explain to her about her dad, but she never seemed to grasp it. I still hear it in my head like it was yesterday. The last words she said to me, Daddy would never leave me, she screamed, before running to her room and slamming the door. That was the last time I heard my baby girl speak. I took her to a psychiatrist two towns over in Sykeston, thinking that maybe he could finally help her to grieve normally, in a more healthy way. Miss Cowell, the doctor began, Taylor is just grieving in the only way she knows how. She has never experienced loss before. It's only natural for a child to respond this way. My recommendation is that you get her out of the house, just the two of you. Spend quality time together doing something that doesn't involve your loss. I honestly didn't know what to do with Taylor. Charlie was always the one who spent time with her. It wasn't that I didn't want to. It was just that I hadn't been given the opportunity to. Thank you, doctor. I will figure something out. I smiled at the idea of doing something fun with Taylor. But what? I thought about it on the car ride home. But it wasn't until I walked through the front door that I saw it. On the refrigerator was a pamphlet that said Mingo National Wildlife Refuge on it. Of course, that was it. Charlie had been making plans to take Taylor on a hike through Mingo to see the wildlife. I yelled up the stairs excitedly to Taylor. Honey, come downstairs. Mommy wants to talk to you. I was smiling so big that she must have thought I was crazy as she came down the stairs into the kitchen. You and I are going to go hiking at Mingo tomorrow. How does that sound? I gushed, unable to control my excitement. Taylor just stood there, not making a sound. But before she walked back up the stairs, I swore I saw a partial smile cross her face. It was not the reaction I was hoping for, but it was a start. The rest of the night was usual. We had a good dinner. I gave Taylor a bath and told her we needed to get some sleep because we had a big day tomorrow. After tucking her into bed, I made my way back downstairs to pack us a lunch. I put sunscreen, bug spray, and a few non-perishable snacks into an old backpack before making my way to bed. I barely slept that night. Sheer excitement and joy enveloped me. This was going to be the first time in a very long time that Taylor and I would get to do something fun, just us girls. I liked the sound of that. Eventually sleep did come, and I awoke to my alarm screaming at me, and sunlight shining on my face. I dressed Taylor and myself before gathering up all the things we would need for this hike. Taylor seemed a little more cheery that morning. She wasn't speaking still, but she just seemed a little more like her old self. On the car ride to Mingo, I tried to explain to her that she had to stay close to me and to watch out for snakes as they were bound to be out and about. Once we entered into Mingo, I could see that there weren't any cars parked or hikers out yet. Not unusual, though. It was still early, I guessed. Taylor barely waited long enough for me to put the car into park before unbuckling her seatbelt and jumping out of the car. Hold on, Tay, I said lightly, happy to see her so animated. As I made my way around the car to where she stood, I could see that she was staring at something down the trail. 
What is it? What do you see? I asked, thinking that it might be a deer or a turkey crossing the trail. Daddy, she said, smile beginning to form on her face. Shocked from hearing her speak for the first time since her father died, I just stood there staring at her, mouth hanging open. It took me a few seconds to gain my composure back after that bombshell. Once I did, I knelt down in front of her and softly said, Taylor, do you remember what I told you about your daddy? He's in heaven, sweetheart. He couldn't possibly be here right now. Taylor just leaned her head around to the side of me, still staring down the trail. I turned to look down the trail, thinking that maybe there was a hiker after all, and she was just mistaking him for Charlie. But there was no one there. Trying to avert her attention and change the mood, I smiled really big, and in my cheeriest voice I said, Come on, we better get a move on before the mosquitoes make breakfast out of us. She kept staring down the trail, and then she waved. Daddy. There it was again. Before I could get a word out, Taylor had taken off full sprint down the trail. She was laughing all the while, something else she hadn't done since Charlie's death. Taylor, come back right now, I scolded, voice raising in pitch. She kept running. Before I could give chase, she was into the woods and out of my sight. I prayed to God to help me catch her as I took up chase. Once I made it to the place where Taylor had entered the woods, I could tell that I was going to have a hard time making my way through the thick undergrowth. There were sharp briars everywhere. How had Taylor made it through all of this without being cut to pieces? I pushed my way through, feeling the little thorns poke and tear my skin. I called out her name loudly for what seemed like hours, pushing my way through the woods. My legs were cut to ribbons. Long cuts were visible on virtually every inch of my legs. Some were deeper than others. Blood starting to run down my legs. I couldn't stop. I had to find Taylor. After stopping for a minute to catch my breath and assess the cuts on my legs, I noticed that there was a clearing. It was only 25 yards away. I began to move toward the open area. Laying on the ground by a small sapling was the blue ribbon that I had tied in Taylor's hair this morning. There were a few small red dots on it, I noticed as I picked it up. Blood. It was Taylor's blood. I knew it had to be. Taylor! I screamed as loud as I possibly could, searching the surrounding area with my eyes. I got no response. I continued walking through the woods towards the clearing but as I got closer, I could hear talking. It was Taylor's voice, coming through the small stand of trees that was in the very center of the clearing. Her words were inaudible, but I knew it was her. Taylor, you frighten me. Let's go, I said, walking closer toward the stand of trees. I was only a few yards away and a little irritated at this point when I heard her soft voice say, But Daddy, I don't want to come into the trees. Just come out here. This isn't fun anymore. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Honey, let's go. Mommy's tired, and this isn't funny. No, Daddy, I don't want to. Just come home. Uh, okay, but let me tell Mommy first. She misses you too, you know. I hear her cry every night. Sometimes she sprays your cologne on your pillow at night. Can't you at least tell her it's okay? She stopped talking abruptly. By the time I made it to where her voice had been coming from, I looked around the little grove of trees, but I couldn't see her. I called out to her, but with no luck. I decided to push my way into the little stand of trees. Surely she was hiding in there. I was scared by this point. How had she known about the cologne? I didn't believe she was playing a game anymore. No child has a mature conversation like that to imaginary friends, or things that weren't there. I hadn't realized it, but my heart was racing, and I was beginning to feel a knot in my stomach. Someone was out here with my daughter and he had intentions to harm her, no doubt. This realization hit me hard. I began pushing through the limbs as fast as I could. I couldn't see anyone, but I yelled in a panicked voice, Don't you touch her, you creep, or I'll kill you! As I pushed farther in, I heard Taylor scream. It was a scream of pure terror. My heart sank as I finally pushed through to a small little cutout in the grove. It was no more than ten feet wide, and it was a perfect circle. Taylor was on her stomach, face down on a large pile of small bones. There must have been five or more sets of bones scattered around the clearing. I could see no one else in there with her. Once I was completely free of the branches, I raced to Taylor, scooping her up in my arms. She was breathing hard, as I turned her over to see three deep cuts on her abdomen. They looked like clean cuts that had been made with a razor, but they were deep. I could see her intestines starting to push up through the gashes. 
Taylor's eyes were transfixed on something standing above us, but I saw nothing. I tried to put pressure on her stomach to stop the bleeding, but all it did was cause her to lurch up in pain, blood now running out of both sides of her mouth. I didn't know what to do. She took one long, ragged breath, raising her arm to point above me and said, It's going to... She took another long, wet breath. Eat me. Frantic. I replied, half screaming, tears rolling down my face. What is baby? What's going to eat you? The bear man. Can't you see him? He's right beside you. She managed to get out before another wave of pain rendered her speechless. Leave us alone! I screamed, still not seeing whatever it was that was hurting her, but feeling as if someone or something was in fact hovering above me. I held her for another few seconds before I watched as her chest was ripped apart by invisible claws, spewing her blood in every direction. She let out a loud, painful scream before going limp. I tried to throw myself over her, but it was no use. This thing was still able to continue shredding her now lifeless body to ribbons. I felt her leg get torn from her body. Pieces of her were being pulled from my grasp, and I could do nothing to stop it. Fear finally took the place of grief as her head was pulled from her neck. I quickly stood up, dropping the little bit of Taylor's torso that was left in my lap on the ground. I ran. I don't know how long I ran for before I made it back to the trail, but once I cleared the trees and onto the trail, I swear I heard a deep roar ring out from the direction I had just came from. Whether it was from shock, terror, or exhaustion, I passed out on the trail. I woke up in a hospital bed in Poplar Bluff. The police were waiting as well as a state game warden in the hall. They both came into my room after the doctor had checked to make sure that I was okay. They asked a lot of questions about how everything happened. Apparently there was enough of Taylor's blood on my clothes that rubbed off on trees and bushes as I ran away from the bear man that they were able to follow the trail it had made back to the small grove in the clearing. I told them that it was a big bear, and that there were bones of other people in the grove of trees as well. Miss Cowell, we searched the area. There were no other bones found, but we did find what we believe to be the last little bit of your daughter's body, and a few tracks leading out of the grove, but they seemed to disappear once the animal made it to the tree line. Bears are not native to this area, so it perplexes me as to how one made it this far south. We will continue to search and let you know of any new findings, the game warden said in a half-hearted attempt at sounding hopeful. I felt my heart sink as he said this, but realized it would be useless to tell them what had really happened. If I told them that a bear man had somehow lured my daughter into the woods, making her believe he was her daddy, and then killed her while I sat holding her in my arms, ripping her apart, and somehow she could see and hear him but I couldn't, they would have locked me up and heavily medicated me. I remained silent. They let me go home after I was released from the hospital, said they'd be in touch if anything were to come up. I haven't heard a word from the authorities since, and I know I never will. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you liked it, I'd love it if you'd shared it or give it a thumbs up. Let's let YouTube know that it's a good video and it should be watched. This Sunday, the 9th, I believe it is, at 2 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to be doing a live stream. It's going to consist of like an AMA or ask me anything, reading some other stories and generally just chilling around and, and having a good time. If you want to come and hang out and ask me different questions or what have you, then I would encourage you to please show up. Otherwise, thank you again for watching. I hope you have a great day. We'll see you on Sunday. And if not on Sunday, in the next video, take care.